Welcome to Harlow on Healthcare. I'm David Harlow, and I invite you to join me by my virtual hearth as I sit down with healthcare leaders to discuss building the future of healthcare. Today, my guest is Ryan Natsky, Chief Revenue Officer for Trust Commerce, a sphere company. Trust Commerce is in the business of digital payments in the healthcare space and other spaces. And Ryan, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Hi, David. It's great to be here. Looking forward to having with you today. So if you don't mind, give us a thumbnail sketch of how you came to be at your present company doing what you're doing and how that might give us some insight into your perspective on the challenges and opportunities in the healthcare space. Sure, absolutely. So I've been here at Trust Commerce for about five and a half years now. We are an integrated payments company, but my background does come more from the health IT side of things. So I started my career at Epic. Um, I was on the implementation team at Epic, getting large medical centers live with their enterprise EHR. I transitioned roles to work with the different Epic integrations and partnerships and vendors that they interact with. So Epic does a whole lot, but Epic doesn't do everything. So one of the areas that Epic works with a third party is for things like payments integrations. And that's just one. There are also medication databases and medical devices and all sorts of things that need to talk to the EHR or talk to the patient portal to complete all the workflows needed to deliver great care. So it was a great learning experience to see how kind of everything across Epic worked, but then also everything beyond Epic worked. And it was an amazing learning experience. It was a great place to work. From Epic, I went to a venture capital fund called HealthX Ventures, also based here in Madison, joined right at the very beginning, helped with finishing out the fundraising on the first fund and building out the first portfolio. But I learned after a couple of years that I really wanted to be at a software company again, building a company from within and rather than being on the investor side. So I got back in touch with the trust commerce team because I knew them from my Epic time. And the timing just seemed like a great fit. During my time at the venture fund, I was doing a lot of market research and learning what's going on within healthcare. And it was just very clear that the patient payment and patient billing space had a lot of opportunity and it's not a fixed area. It's, I think a lot of people would call it broken in how patient billing works, what that patient experience looks like and knowing where trust commerce was and the types of customers that they worked with and having integrations to groups like Epic. It just seemed like a great overlap of an area within healthcare that had a lot of opportunity and a lot of change was happening while still having that foot in healthcare and trying something a little bit new and getting more familiar with the payment side of things. So it's been great working here and I've learned a ton about payments in the last five and a half years, surrounded by a team of payments experts that have been doing it a lot much longer than me and bringing those two worlds together to help some of these healthcare providers with these workflows and their patients. Great. Thanks for that background. And people in healthcare like to think that healthcare is special, healthcare is different. And even you touched on your past experience with Epic. Some may think of Epic as a sort of a unitary experience that may be the same across organizations. But people say with respect to academic medical centers, if you've seen one academic medical center, you've seen one academic medical center. And my sense is if you've seen one Epic implementation, you've seen one Epic implementation. I've heard tell even of multiple Epic systems or other EHR systems across a single growing system. And within each sort of subset, things are different, right? And we think about payment, we think about e-commerce, we think about stuff that should be just drop dead simple, and it is in other parts of the economy, right? There are Mm -hmm. things that we can do super easily when it comes to booking a flight or buying a book or whatever a book is these days. It's no longer really a book. And it's hard to imagine that happening at scale with such uniformity in healthcare. 
I wonder mm-hmm. if you could comment just generally on the challenge of transposing that hoped for digital e-commerce future into the healthcare space. Yeah, for sure. Healthcare absolutely is unique. And just the insurance aspect of that is something that you don't see in a lot of areas. When you subscribe to Netflix, when you do a Costco order online, you know what that's going to cost before it shows up. And when it hits your, when it hits your credit card statement or as you're shopping around, we don't really have that in healthcare. We're getting closer to it, but if you look not too long ago, we've got some really good estimation tools now and some legislation helping with that. But you might not have any idea what something's going to cost until well after that service is delivered. So you can't really make the same consumer choices that you do have in other areas. So I think that is a huge part that makes healthcare different. And I think there's been a lot of great advancements in the last couple of years there's to help with that, whether that is a cost estimator tool or places posting their prices online to help us make better decisions and go into some of these things with eyes wide open of what to plan for and budget for. But there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still cases where even in my own personal experience, I went in for a routine checkup and the provider said, hey, I think I'd like to do this today. I said, all right, sounds good. And then turns out there was a cost associated with that. There was no warning of, hey, this is going to cost you this or, hey, we're not sure about your insurance. We'll check about this. They just went ahead and did it, and I got a bill that I wasn't necessarily expecting. And fortunately, I'm in a position where it's fine. Um, I was able to handle it, and I'm in this space, so I expected that to be part of it. But not everybody has that same background. There's still some challenges there, and there are some things about healthcare, too, that make it a little bit more delayed from some of these other industries because of that insurance aspect. And what you might pay and what I might pay for the same procedure or the same visit probably isn't the same if we don't have the same insurance. And now it's funny you mentioned that, and it just brings to mind an ad I saw recently for one of the hotel booking apps, right? Two people get to the check-in counter at a hotel at the same time. They're checking in for the same kind of room, and one person is paying significantly less than the other. Because they use the right app, and... You don't expect to see that necessarily in that setting, but we are at some level familiar with the idea that what we pay for healthcare depends on our insurance and we can have quote unquote good coverage or quote unquote bad coverage. But the basic problem that you describe, people give the sort of the counter example, would you ever go out to dinner and order dinner and with no prices on the menu and understand that you would get a bill six weeks later telling you how much dinner was? Who wouldn't accept that in any other arena? Probably wouldn't be a very popular restaurant, no. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't really last. But we've, we ex- we've accepted that over time because somebody else was paying. And as more and more cost sharing has crept into the system over the last, I'll say, 20 years, it's longer than that, but within the past 20 years, it's getting more significant. It starts to matter to people, right? It matters to people and it also, it matters to the providers as well, because now their revenue is a much bigger part of that comes from the patient than from insurance. So they've got to focus on collecting more and some of the processes that they might have had five, 10, 15 years ago may not scale to what is needed now or be, or you might not be able to accept the level of uncollected amount because it's going to be such a bigger impact to your bottom line. So it, it impacts both sides of it. it, impacts the provider and what they're able to do and how they interact with their patients, but also the patient experience. What can they budget for? Is if this, do I even want to go in because I don't know what it's going to cost and I don't know if I can afford it. There's all sorts of stats out there of people having a really hard time with an unplanned $500 bill. And if they think that there's a chance that I'm not feeling well, I got this thing on my knee or I've got this pain in my chest, but I might get a really big bill. Maybe it'll just go away. Maybe you're not getting that same care. So it, it impacts everybody. 
And then you defer that care and it turns out to be not a $500 bill, but a $5,000 bill and Mm -hmm. a week in the hospital or whatever, because somebody has deferred care for something that could be addressed more easily. And there we get into a whole host of other issues, like should preventive care be covered with no out-of-pocket? And that's, that's a whole other conversation, and that's now being fought out in the federal court system. But the, the theme is predictability and understandability of cost and what we're likely to see happen if we move forward with procedure X or Y. And it's not something that we're necessarily used to in this context. So... The goal overall is to bring healthcare into the present or the future, make it more like other sectors, right? So things are predictable. There's been a tremendous amount of resistance in the part of the sector generally to posting transparent pricing. There are laws that get passed and then people drag their feet and then things get enforced and rules get a little bit more specific. So we're getting there. We're getting there in terms of pricing transparency. We're getting there in terms of data interoperability. And you mentioned a very interesting point, which is it's not only hard for the consumer, for the patient, it's hard for the healthcare provider. So in in a moment, I'm going to ask you to dive into that a little deeper. But first... I just want to say that this is Harlow on Healthcare, if you're just tuning in, and we are coming to you on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm David Harlow, and my guest today is Ryan Natsky, Chief Revenue Officer for Trust Commerce at Sphere. So, Ryan, so where are we? What can we do? How can we move this thing forward? From a low-hanging fruit perspective, I think some of the stuff is, even though insurance is part of this whole thing, there are some things that groups can, that healthcare providers can do to make things easier for their patients. And it goes beyond just this payment side of things. It can, it's a lot of that engagement and your interaction with your provider happens outside of that office visit or the hospital room or things like that. It starts with scheduling an appointment and filling out the forms ahead of your visit and confirming your insurance information. A lot of that is still done on like over the phone and on a clipboard in the waiting room. And in, it's very time consuming. I think some of the, what we've seen a lot more of recently, it's, I wouldn't say it's well adopted everywhere, but things like being able to schedule your appointment online. I think when you, a lot of people's experience today when it comes to scheduling an appointment is you're calling in and you're not sure if you're going to be, if you're going to get a person right away, if they're going to put you on hold, do I have this time? People are busy, they're working, they've got families, they've they've got other stuff going on. Maybe they don't have time to even sit down and think about this until nine, 10 o'clock at night and the scheduling office probably isn't open. So being able to provide some tools like that to, to allow patients to enter in the front door at that top of the funnel a little bit easier through things like online scheduling. And then those interactions ahead, once that appointment is scheduled with the appointment reminders, but maybe more than an appointment reminder, just saying, all right, David, your appointment is next Wednesday, but by the way, it looks like your copay is going to be this. And by the way, you've got an outstanding balance from your last visit of that. And your insurance card is expired. Can we get that updated? Can we get that taken care of so that you can do some of those things before you even show up to be able to make that experience smoother and faster and get you to the care that you need without as much of that stuff happening ahead of time while you're at that facility. And when it comes to the actual payment piece, maybe delivering an estimate proactively instead of waiting for somebody to call in and ask, hey, how much is this going to cost me? Getting things like a card on file, um, making it so that when that payment is actually due, you don't have to go find your wallet or key something in. It's there. Hey, David, you've got a balance due of $30 for your copay. It looks like we've got your card on file that ends in one, two, three, four. Should we just use this? Yes. Away it goes. It just happens. And that's some of the things that are happening in other industries where if you think about it, 
you're probably using the actual physical plastic card in your pocket much less than you were years ago because places have it stored. You're setting up for subscription payments or, or you're using it stored within your browser on your phone or on your computer. So by taking advantage of some of these things that are being done elsewhere, it's going to help make healthcare feel more modern, be a better consumer experience, but also help with the throughput, help reduce some of your staff time of manually scheduling appointments or reaching out to patients to try to collect a balance due. It's just a win-win for everybody if we can continue the adoption of some of these tools within healthcare. And we are on the right track. I think some of this stuff is happening, but it is not something that I think is widely adopted or used across the board yet. Is there any way in which you would say, yeah, healthcare is different and some of these things just don't translate, like whether it's from Netflix or Amazon or online banking or travel, et cetera? Yeah, I think especially when you start getting into kind of the acute care setting and emergency medicine, there you might be coming in for an appointment and really nobody knows what kind of care you're going to be delivering. It's really hard to predict or give somebody an estimate before you have a diagnosis or before you really know what's going on. And unfortunately, those are also some of the higher dollar amount items as well. Your office visits, those are lower cost. They're going to, they're, they're lower dollar amount. They're going to be more predictable. I think we're further along there. But on these acute care settings, you're coming at those in a bit more of a reactive fashion. You can be as proactive as you can, but if you get in a bike accident or something like that, you don't necessarily know that. So then it's coming at it from the other side of, all right, how can we be empathetic with how we are engaging with this individual that now owes maybe $10,000 that they weren't planning for? Are we considering where they are in, in how much they can afford? Are we proactively putting them on a payment plan? Or are we trying to avoid sending this to collections and creating this really terrible experience and hurting their credit scores, things like that? So it, there are some areas where we can be more proactive and more like that retail consumer experience if it's predictable, but healthcare has a big chunk of that. Just, that's just not the case. We can't predict everything that's going to happen there. And in that, those cases, you just got to shift the mindset a little bit and, and be and, and kind of treat the patient as that individual and rather than not just giving a one size fits all. Hey, here's your bill. Pay us when you can. Yeah. I love that frame of empathy for an individual patient or customer rather than saying, yeah, a more cookie cutter approach. First, we're going to do this, then we're going to do that. And we do this for academic medical centers, and we do that for rural hospitals, and we do this for specialty group practices. So I guess what I hear you saying is that, yeah, sure, healthcare is different. And not only is healthcare different, but every everybody who comes to a healthcare encounter is different, and everyone who comes for a healthcare encounter is a different person or persona on different days. So, yeah, healthcare does not have a demographic. We're all patients at some point, so it doesn't matter your age, your economic status. You're going to need to see you're going to need to see a provider at some point in your life, and healthcare has to be able to adapt to that. Yeah. So, from the perspective of trying to have things like a standardized product design, a platform that makes it sound super hard. So how do you work from both ends towards a reasonable middle? It it is really hard. And I live in the payment space all the time. And even just with this space, there's, there are going to be patients that you need to send a paper statement to. That's just how they're going to get notified of their bill. And they're going to put a check, a paper check in that envelope that comes back that is put in that statement and they're going to mail it into you and you're going to have to have a lockbox process to make that work. Hopefully you're not sending that to everybody because I don't think that's everybody's primary preferred way of paying their bill, but not everybody is going to have a internet connection or even a credit card in some cases. So you have to adapt and be able to give a lot of options to your patients when it comes to paying their bills We see groups that obviously continue with the paper statements, but try to be selective of those. Get patients to try to, all right, sign up for e-statements, sign up to text to pay. We're going to set up an IVR so that you can call in 
and maybe you can talk to somebody in our contact center and take care of it, or maybe you can do it self-service with some sort of automated IVR system, getting that card on file. You can have it a lot of different ways, and one of the things that's unique about this intersection of healthcare and payments, but also very exciting, is that you have to be able to support all of these different ways to accept payments. You need to have a point of service at the front desk, but also have your back office be able to take them over the phone. You need online, you need recurring, but also you do need to be able to support some of these paper statements. I don't see that necessarily getting any better. I think just generally people are going to get more used to the different technologies and ways to pay and the adoption of those will continue to get higher. But it is a complex world and I think being able to support these multiple ways to have your patients pay and be able to interact with your patients is going to need to continue. And the great news is that there are great tools out there to do that. And it's not, this isn't necessarily new either. It's something that I think a lot of groups have some good experience with. There's, there are ways to implement this successfully. What you yeah, just- yeah. I was encouraged to see recently, I got a bill, a paper bill in the mail and I open it up and there's a return postage paid envelope for a check. If I rip up, rip off the bottom of the page and send it back with a check. And my first reaction to that is, oh my gosh, I have to <laughs> write a check. You got to be kidding me. And then I see there's also a QR code where I can pay for my phone. And there's also a phone number I can call. Right. To, but yeah, that's for me, that's like a sigh of relief when I see something like that. Other people may react to the same thing and be relieved that they can still write a check, as you described. It takes all kinds, and we need to maintain all of those doors in. So that's definitely progress from where we were. And I guess the final question here, final thing to think about is where are we going? So we've definitely made progress, but if you were to wake up tomorrow and find yourself five years in the future, say, what's one thing in healthcare that you would hope or maybe expect to find has changed drastically? Yeah, I think the things that are top of mind for me is more transparency and more clarity. I live this stuff every single day and I still get statements from my provider or from my kids or things like that. And I'm just like, why do I owe this? I don't really get it. And I think that's an area where patients aren't missing their bill in many cases because they don't want to pay. I think it's a lot of it is because it's just confusing. And I got an EOB and I got a statement from my anesthesiologist, but also from the hospital and also from the doctor, which one do I pay? Is this duplicative? I think that's an area where I think we have to get better as an industry in because it the dollar amounts are just so big that if it doesn't get better, it's going to really harm these healthcare providers as a business and their ability to continue to provide care and pay their staff and do things like that. So providing more transparent upfront information of this is what you owe and why the, when you're making decisions about your own care or having those conversations with your provider, having a potential dollar amount or at least some more information and context around what that means financially specific to your health plan it is going to continue to become more of the norm to be able to limit the amount of surprises, limit the amount of bad experiences. When I think of some of the I'll call them the horror stories of friends or family members that and they say, hey, I had this really terrible experience with my healthcare provider. It's almost never because they didn't like their doctor or they didn't like their nurses. It was because they got a surprise bill and they was just, where did this come from? I'm getting charged for this. I'm getting bounced between insurance and the provider. I don't know how to take care of this. It's a lot of it is related to that financial side. So Having more transparency, having more clarity, I think it's just, it, it's inevitable. We have to get there. And I think that's an area where I would like to see and hopefully play a little bit of part of making that part easier. Great. Ryan, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you very much, David. Really like talking to you. You have been listening to Harlow on Healthcare. Join us at healthcarenowradio.com. Let's continue the conversation on building the future of healthcare together at hashtag Harlow on HC. I'm David Harlow, keeping the fire going and holding a seat open for you. Until next time. Mm-hmm.